Good morning. I'm Andrew Lansley. I'm Strategic Counsel at Lowe Associates and Lowe Associates have the very great privilege and pleasure to work with our colleagues at D DG Regio to support the border fo focal point network. Uh, and these border breakfasts uh, are a signal part of that, an opportunity for um, very meaningful discussions between all of those who are participants in cross-border cooperation across the Union. Um, the, this is the 14th breakfast debate, and this morning we are concerned with uh, how the, um, uh, the reflections on post-27 cohesion policy can best support border regions. I, I know in previous discussions we've had um, very uh, powerful examples of how cross-border cooperation can be, as it were, a laboratory for European integration, very significant positive opportunities. Uh, we have also uh, had some very useful discussions about what are the obstacles to that cross-border cooperation uh, and how we can uh, develop tools to uh, reduce and remove those obstacles. Uh, and also that as we do so, uh, cross-border cooperation, if optimised, can make a significant contribution to European growth. I think it was uh, theoretically as much as 3.8% uh, enhancement to growth. And even if there are practical difficulties in getting that far, it is clearly a significant potential. But perhaps most importantly, what we've seen many times in our border breakfast debates uh, is how cross-border cooperation can demonstrate the value of place-based policies and of people-to-people -people cooperation. Uh, and of course, that is essentially where cohesion policy uh, enables this to happen, bringing together programmes in uh, discrete places to see how policies can impact and improve the lives of the citizens of the Union. Sorry, that's um, just uh, my um, uh, summary of some of the very interesting discussions we've had today. We're looking forward to a very expert panel uh, and an introduction uh, from Slavomir Tokarski, uh, who is the director of the European Ter Territorial Cooperation, Macro Regions, Interreg and Programme Inter Implementation at the European Commission. Um, delighted, Slavomir, you're with us to be able to introduce our discussion this morning. Over to you. Yes, hello. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew, and, and good morning, everybody. Uh, and maybe just a couple of words. Uh, that would allow us to a little bit to place this discussion in a broader context on, on, on of the consultations on the policy future. But first and foremost, why are we having this discussion already now? One can validly say that the implementation just started. This is basically the first year of the implementation and we are already talking about the future. So why so early? But uh, I think, first of all, this is the cycle of the policy making. And, and you will remember that already in the early 2025, we'll be drafting the regulations for the new cohesion policy post 27. But maybe even more importantly, I have to say the discussion within the Commission on the policy future has already started. And there are good reasons for this. You don't you don't have to, to know the internal cuisine of, of the Commission to just to look around and see what we have. So we have wars, we have the issue of European defence, we have migration, we have natural disasters, we have accession and enlargement. And all this is crying for resources uh, and for money. So uh, uh, the discussion has been starting right now, and I think we, People dealing with, with territorial cooperation, with cross-border programs, we need to have a good narrative in order to find a place in this future policy. So it is not the business as usual. I think I want to be very clear on this, that we will just do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it will be all fine. Uh, so that is why in Santiago, in this interreg annual event a couple of weeks ago, we have launched already these consultations on, on the policy future in two strands, asking on one hand programs, but also asking programs to talk to citizens and, and to bring their views to, to, to this debate. And I think this is an important point. Uh, um, I mean, I will be in the listening mode, we'll be in the listening mode listening from you. What what do you believe is, is the greatest value added of the policy and how this could be, you know, our card for, for, for getting a better future. But uh, this uh, uh, issue of citizens, I think it is one of the strongest cards that we can play because we are the program which by nature are closer to people and closer to citizens, even uh, more so than the mainstream cohesion policy. And there are good reasons for this because we are often operating at the lower scale of the sub-regional scale. <clears throat> we have people-to-people -people projects 
And we have also all those approaches that allow citizens to have a greater say on, on how our policy and our projects look like. And if you, if you take it and, and, and put it against this backdrop, first of all, of social polarization, and, and this here, he, the people to people approach is, is I, I believe, very valid and, and, and very important. It's a sort of good and positive message that everybody is waiting for. But we also have all this <clears throat> issue of participatory democracy, economic de democracy, however you call it. So involving citizens to a greater extent through participatory approaches in policy making. So I think it's also an important element that we should consider for the future. And maybe the second one, <clears throat> which is enlargement. Uh, um, we have the date right now, which is 2030. Uh, the, the countries are, are engaging on, on, on the process of the accession. Yesterday, the Commission uh, uh, proposed to the Council giving green light for starting accession negotiations with Ukraine. So it's it, a lot is happening and, and we we are the, the, the only policy that has already institutions in place in countries like Moldova, and, and Ukraine and have a good track of cooperation with, with Western Balkans. So I think this is also the important card that we should think about um, when, when talking about the future. So I think that um, all in all, I am quite positive. Uh, uh, and I think we should be in the offensive rather than defensive mode. Mm -hmm. I also think that the work that you are doing on, on, on eliminating obstacles it's also very relevant because the single market is getting more and more uh, uh, importance in the context of what's happening to globalization. You have this fragmenting of globalization. So the well-functioning single market, uh, 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 which is functioning seamlessly across the borders, this is a big issue as well. Uh, uh, so I think all is there, but we need really to bring it together into a sort of good good, good narrative. Uh, um, and, and that is why we started this process so early. Uh, we will organize a webinar in a couple of weeks where we'll explain to you a bit better how, how do we see it. Uh, and the idea would be that we do it in the, the all 2024 with some milestones, but then the big bank event would be somewhere in the beginning of 2025, possibly in, in Gorica, in Gorica, Nova Gorica, which is somehow symbolical uh, for, for what the cross-border policy can do. Uh, uh, and we are starting right now. So <clears throat> this is just not, not a one-off event, but this is just the beginning of something bigger. And I, I, I would like to bring this also, this, this sense of, of, of us, all of us belonging to, to, to really one community and working hand in hand. It's not that we will impose the views. We really want to listen to you and, and really we want that we, you know, crush our heads together and, and come up with something good and sensible. So that is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Slavomir, thank you very much indeed, uh, and that's a very helpful uh, introduction, sets the context excellently for, for our discussions. This is a participatory event. Uh, we would like our uh, participants all to contribute in various ways. Uh, you'll be aware, those who've joined us before, that uh, the chat function is, um, is a mechanism by which, please, if you have questions that you would like to put to the panel, please put them up on the chat function. Uh, and also, I think both our panellists and other participants from time to time are using that to give people access to the links and references uh, for reports and other ways in which people can follow up uh, on the uh, discussion. Uh, but in addition, as part of the participation, and before we reach the panel, uh, I should launch the, the first of our two polls. We want to get a response directly from all of our participants about how they uh, see the relationship between post-27 cohesion policy and our border regions. Uh, so poll one, um, if my colleagues would be kind enough to show uh, all of our participants poll one. The question we're asking, please, is what should the main priorities be in the post-27 cohesion policy to better support border regions? Now, there are several options which I will quickly read through. Enhancing digital connectivity in border areas, boosting the green transition in cross-border territories, increasing investment in cross-border education programmes, strengthening cross-border healthcare cooperation, expanding cross-border trade, business and labour opportunities, establishing more cross-border transport connections, and developing sustainable cross-border governance. So please, 
look at that. Um, you're not required to identify only one. Identify what you regard as the main priorities. And we will, I will report the results of that first poll and launch the second poll uh, after we've had an opportunity to commence our panel by listening to the first of our panellists, which is uh, Professor uh, Dr. Eduardo Medeiros, uh, whom will be very well known to, um, I think, all of those who are involved in cross-border cooperation across Europe. Uh, uh, Eduardo, you're a, a professor of geography and a research fellow. You've been a widespread contributor to uh, many um, policy discussions across the European Union, including to the reflection group on post-27 cohesion policy. Uh, Eduardo, would you um, tell us something about what, in your view, uh, might be the priorities in the post-cohesion, post-27 cohesion policy for border regions? Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, yes, um, <clears throat> for a long time I've been uh, supporting my vision for uh, cross-border cooperation based on uh, what I think is the concept of cross-border cooperation, which is, in my opinion, supported by two main goals. The first of all, number one, is to reduce um, uh, or mitigate the cross-border barriers. Um, and uh, the second one is to promote, uh, in simple terms, uh, territorial development. And the territorial development in embraces uh, several dimensions, like you know, uh, envir uh, environmental sustainability, territorial governance, uh, spatial planning, uh, economic uh, competitiveness, social inclusion. So it's it's very broad. But um, when it comes to um, the focus on mitigating or reducing border barriers, because I don't believe in eliminating border barriers, um, uh, they should be focused, I think, in, from all the studies uh, that I've seen and I've participated and I've uh, worked together with the Commission, there is three main, three main border barriers that still persist across uh, European Union uh, cross-border areas. Uh, the first one is uh, related to legal and administrative uh, uh, barriers. And here, uh, <clears throat> I always suggest that uh, um, the Commission should uh, follow an ongoing initiative, which is called UB Solutions, that is a concrete solution to find, uh, to discover, and to propose concrete solutions to reduce as much as possible persisting legal and border barriers of all sorts. The second barrier is uh, cultural barrier, specifically language. Language is, continues to be um, a very important um, uh, barrier all across Europe, and I've experienced this uh, all the time because I travel a lot. And uh, what I propose here is that there is a support to use English as a secondary uh, mandatory language in all public services in, in the EU, especially in transport, but in other, because this will facilitate the lives of many uh, European citizens. The third one, and you can see here in the polls uh, also that many people consider, and this is actually um, um, a barrier that affects a lot directly and indirectly the lives of EU citizens, is related to uh, cross-border accessibility, uh, and specifically the lack or reduced number of available cross-border transports. You can see there's around 26%, 18% uh, uh, in the polls already uh, focus on this uh, important barrier. And here, uh, there is a lot to be done. The Commission has worked a lot uh, on, on studies. I, uh, I remember in 2019, I was there in the Commission and an event organized by, by Ricardo Ferreira, um, and we produced a paper on this. Um, so, um, but there is a need to uh, support um, more investment in the Interreg, through the Interreg, in, in, in uh, um, pr proposing uh, concrete uh, projects that um, help to reduce this cross-border transport barrier all across your regions. So, um, uh, ideally, that should be, uh, I say, a, a one Europe, one system. I, I know that this is uh, still very far away um, to be uh, being achieved. Um, so I also propose that a European transnational um, mechanism of all sorts, not not a European cross-border mechanism, because European cross-border mechanism will create an additional barrier, uh, border uh, after the border region. So uh, I think a transnational mechanism will be uh, the solution to actually 
in this case, eliminate borders. It's the only solution to eliminate borders. But this is, is, is far, far too, basically too complex. And the last thing I think is the support, not just to cross-border uh, cooperation as we we are been implementing it in Europe, but um, start to plan ahead. I'm a geographer, so I'm, I'm focused on spatial planning, which is anticipating problems. And I also supported the idea of uh, promoting that these interact projects also promote uh, bottom-up cross-border planning, you know, uh, involving the participatory approaches from citizens, of course, to increase the financial capacity, a more strategic vision uh, in the long term, and also a, a, a better uh, integration between existing cross-border plans from national, local, and region that already exist. So these are my takeaways uh, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, the, the future of uh, cross-border cooperation. Eduardo, thank you very much. Um, and I, I, I hope in our discussions we will similarly from everybody have uh, uh, very pointed recommendations that can be taken forward and uh, offered to the reflections group about cohesion policy. Thank you for that. Can I let, let's look at the um, response to our first poll. Uh, those who can see it on the chat uh, can read it there, but let me quickly just um, run through that. So of all the responses, the um, each has got some um, indication of priority, but the most, 23%, has been um, given to developing sustainable cross-border governance. Uh, after that, uh, the next um, uh, most indicated priority is for establishing more cross-border transport connections. Then after that, expanding cross-border trade, business and labour opportunities, obviously travel to work and linked to the transport as well. Uh, after that, boosting the green transition in cross-border territories, then cross-border healthcare cooperation, then cross-border education programmes, and then digital connectivity. Some of those differences are not large, um, uh, so there is a spread of priorities indicated from our responses. Thank you all very much indeed. Let's uh, launch the second poll as well so that our panellists can get uh, a clear indication of the views of participants and I know our panelists will want to, to chew and discuss what you have said are the priorities. So let's turn to the second poll uh, and the second poll is how can cohesion policy post-27 better support border regions? And here I think it, you may uh, indicate more than one answer um, but uh, as we've seen already in the first poll, it's quite useful to have a sense of the relative uh, ranking of priority. Uh, we have five options that people can choose. Firstly, promote cross-border cooperation in mainstream programmes. Secondly, create an EU legal tool to resolve border obstacles. C. Thirdly, substantially increase funding for European territorial cooperation. Fourthly, D, provide more cooperative tools, structures and options for cross-border regions. And fifthly, E, further enhance bottom-up policy making in cross-border regions. So these are options about how it, the policy can support border regions focused on the structural issues about cohesion policy. Five options there. You can choose more than one. Um, Thank you very much. We'll report that in a short while. But for the moment, delighted that following the uh, Eduardo, we have a, another expert in spatial planning. That is uh, Kitty um, Dubnishki. Uh, Kitty is a, a chief planner at SESCI, which is the Central European Service for Cross-Border Initiatives, um, and has been working on interreg initiatives in Hungary, Slovakia, Romania and Ukraine. Pity you have very practical experience of how this territorial cooperation works. You've seen what our participants felt in the first poll about the range of priorities that could be addressed, but perhaps you tell us something yourself about what uh, you view as the priorities it, from the point of view of the cross-border regions, um, either drawn from those or indeed from others. Kitty, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the opportunity to take part in this interesting discussion and to reflect also uh, the first poll question, as you mentioned. In 
my opinion, as a first step, we should accept that the cohesion of the border regions need, uh, needs a different approach than the mainstream Europe-wide notion of cohesion. We should avoid using the same terminology with the cross-border practices as we do at the mainstream cohesion policy programs. And on, on the contrary, we need to move better from the sectoral approach to the territorial one when we are speaking about uh, border regions. Uh, and I think our main task is to answer the following question. How can we strengthen the cohesion and integration of the border regions? As Professor Madeiros told, we need to eliminate barriers and facilitate uh, territorial development across the borders. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we need a complex toolbox tailored to the border regions. And this toolbox uh, should provide solutions for different fields, like uh, integrated development of the border regions, um, from planning to the monitoring of the implementation. But also we need to identify and uh, mitigate the cross-border obstacles which hamper the daily life uh, of cross-border citizens. And uh, we also strengthen the interaction between the border citizens. And at last, we need also support the effective management of the cross-border governance structures. And if I uh, have uh, more time, that uh, make uh, a look behind uh, each point for a moment. Uh, so first of all, uh, when we are talking uh, about the cross-border developments, I can say that uh, our fundamental approach uh, at SESCI is that the, the cross-border territories should be developed in an integrated way based on the needs and the opportunities of the given border regions. And yes, as you mentioned, in the last years, we have elaborated and evaluated several cross-border integrated programs and drafted cross-border strategies, mainly for EGTCs. And based on these experiences, uh, I think the big, biggest challenge is to find comparable and harmonized data with cross-border flows uh, because without reliable and evidence-based territorial data, the plans, what we needed, cannot be relevant and uh, the implementation cannot be monitored. Uh, for example, uh, interact programs uh, from the previous period uh, had to be evaluated on the basis of uh, the result indicators which are not able to show the impact of the program because the selected indicators are influenced by higher level, mainly by global trends. But I know that uh, the designers uh, of these programs didn't have other options. Uh, so to overcome this first issue, uh, the collection and the observation of cross-border territorial data uh, should be an intervention, including in each future cross-border program. After that, uh, regarding the cross-border obstacles, uh, we can see that the more interaction and cooperation we have in the border region, the more problems arise. Uh, at SESCI, we have been working with uh, our European partners like MOT or EDR for years to overcome uh, this kind of obstacles. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with the B Solutions Initiative, as and I saw uh, since you also also mentioned in the chat. Uh, this uh, initiative is supported by the European Commission and managed by the EBR. And I think uh, you also have heard about the proposal of the European Cross Border Me Mechanism from uh, Mr. Maleiros as well. Uh, and we discussed uh, it in more detail at the previous uh, breakfast debate. And I think all of these uh, initiatives are very important, and this should be further enhanced through the future cohesion policy package. Regarding my third uh, field, uh, supporting uh, cross-border people-to-people interaction is uh, another important aspect uh, which has uh, successfully been informed through the current regulations. And uh, this is a trend to continue in the future. And my last point was that the cross-border governance structures 
these also play an important role in performing various cross-border tasks. And um, based on our experiences, these uh, structures and the border regions, especially in Central Europe, suffer from a lack of human capacity uh, to manage uh, this one. And I think in this field, we need uh, more uh, supporting to capacity building for these structures. So to conclude my answer, the development of the border regions needs a different approach than the current mainstream cohesion policy programs and we need a complex cross-border toolbox enabling the development of border regions in an appropriate integrated way. Pity, thank you very much. That was a really excellent contribution. Thank you very much. Really thought-provoking as well. So thank you very much indeed for, for that contribution. Well, um, as you're a panelist, we, we may well come back to you with a, with a question in a minute. But let me just, uh, before I turn to Simona, let me um, just give us the, uh, you can see it hopefully in the chat, the response to the second poll. So there, um, there are not large differences between many of the um, responses. The, the, the largest uh, number of responses um, suggesting that um, it, the policy could support regions is to further enhance bottom-up policy making in cross-border regions, which I think is reflecting in a sense something very much that you were saying, Kitty, about how the governance of cohesion policy can work. Um, but the others all get very similar amounts. So um, uh, similar number of responses, whether it's the EU legal tool to resolve border obstacles, which you were talking about and Eduardo was, uh, cross-border cooperation in mainstream programs, funding for territorial cooperation, and cooperative tools and structures for cross-border regions all get a similar number of priorities. I wonder if I might um, uh, turn to you, uh, Simona. Um, Simona Polova is Deputy Head of Unit for Interreg Cross-Border Cooperation and Internal Borders uh, in the European Commission. Delighted you're with us on the panel. Don't feel obliged to comment in detail on the second poll, Simona, but perhaps tell us something about uh, further about how cross-border cooperation can be supported using cohesion policy. What are the mechanisms for doing that? Thank you, Andrew, and good morning. Good morning from my side to everybody. Um, well, indeed, um, I think that it is very interesting for us uh, to see the results coming out from the poll, even though we see that that they are indeed very balanced. And, and this shows that that all of these uh, replies are are nearly equally important. Uh, what what should the the priorities be? And uh, just to say that it is very important for us from the Commission to see what people who are connected to the border regions and issues think now when then when the the debate about the future of Interreg and cooperation has started. Um, as it was said also by our director Slavomir at the beginning, uh, we held this uh, Interreg annual event in Santiago de Compostela two weeks ago, where indeed we had the excellent opportunity to discuss for the first time really what role cooperation should have in the future with our programs and also with other guests. And we also had our commissioner Elisa Ferreira there, and uh, there was a debate on the future of Interreg also with Karl Heinz Lamberts, the president of the AEBR. And uh, just to reinforce also what, what Slavomir already said, that it was repeated many times during the event that Europe cannot, cannot simply function without cooperation now. The challenges that were mentioned, such as fires or floods that are related either to climate change or nature protection, just do not recognize borders. And we also see that many border regions in Europe are still suffering from their peripheral location. They are less connected, they have worse public services, we have heard that as well. Uh, we also see that young educated people are leaving them and that makes the quality of life in, the, in these regions declining, as well as trust in the EU integration and democracy. This is also what, what Slavomir was, report, was referring to. So we also do realize that even in, in some border regions that are highly integrated, and there are lots of cross-border interactions there and people are commuting daily, 
there are even more cross-border obstacles that reduce really the potential of those regions and uh, also the cooperation with their neighbours on the other side. So all in all, we all agree that there is a need for a strong territorial cooperation in the future, which either we sh should be supported by, by the funding for Interreg or as well what was mentioned by other tools that we have, which are beyond the funding. Indeed, this message has also uh, clearly come out from the high level group, uh, high level group specialists on cooperation, which was held in July this year, this year, which actually started the debate on the future of Interreg. And there the Commission discussed with independent experts. Uh, Professor Medeiros was one of them, by the way, uh, and also with important regional representatives and stakeholders. What are the key topics that Interreg should in address in the future? And I really strongly advise you to consult the minutes and the presentations of that meeting, which are available on our InfoRegio website. So what did we discuss in Santiago on the post-2027? Well, we, we all agree that we need to continue that what works well and perhaps further develop those features which have high cooperation potential, such as more place-based approach to, to suit the interreg needs. We are all in agreement that every border indeed is different and uh, that different types of borders require specific approaches. Especially now, when, when the Interreg family integrates also cooperation with regions and countries on the EU external borders, and some of them are candidate countries to the EU membership, they are indeed facing specific challenges. And we need to keep that in mind when reflecting about Interreg. We should have the ambition to close the gaps in transport and energy connections, and to ensure that people, goods and energy can smoothly move across borders. And all, last but not least, we should also continue to soften the impact of borders as historical scars. And it was already said to promote people to people cooperation. Um, Slavomir has already referred to the process of consultation that we launched in Santiago, so I will not dwell on it too, uh, too long time. Uh, but indeed, uh, it is important for us to hear uh, from you, from the citizens and from the key stakeholders, what uh, you think should be uh, our priorities for the future. We will also uh, consult our interact programs on the future of policy. Uh, whom we actually asked to organize such public consultations. And um, on the on the future, uh, also for for uh, the support beyond funding, as it was already said, the initiatives such as B solutions, uh, they are uh, very powerful tools to help regions to tackle uh, administrative and legal barriers. And uh, we will do our utmost to keep it. Uh, we are also very happy to see that uh, our interreg specific objective one, which is aimed to improve cross-border governance, has met with such a huge success among the programs. Uh, more than 80 of them selected it. And um, we also, um, as was already tackled uh, at the Commission, we are actively considering to table an amended proposal for the, uh, the cross-border mechanism. Um, that was discussed with you the last time. Um, we are convinced that such a piece of legislation would be a game changer to solve border obstacles. And maybe in this respect, let me remind you that uh, the Commission launched recently a call for evidence, uh, which, uh, which is a way uh, for you to express uh, any sort of opinion uh, if you want to consider uh, which, which would... Um, which would inform the legislative process uh, if this uh, proposal uh, is about to be uh, to be put on the table. Thank you very much. Simona, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's complete our panel before we get into uh, a more open discussion with a, a further uh, opportunity to hear from an expert. That, that is from uh, Sari. Um, Sari Ratio is from Finland. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Um, your expertise, of course, is in that you are part of the European Committee of the Regions uh, and a representative for Finland in the Commission for Territorial Cohesion Policy and EU Budget. So 
right in the midst of the thinking about these issues. Sari, would you tell us something about how this is viewed from the, literally from the uh, ground up, as it were, how are people in border regions thinking about how this can work for their benefit? Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew, and uh, hello, everyone, and greetings from Finland. And uh, definitely, I must say that I'm really happy to join this uh, very important and interesting uh, breakfast debate. First, I want to tell you a small story. Uh, even though at the moment I'm living in the southern Finland, in the city of Hamelin, I'm originally from uh, the border, border of uh, Finland and Sweden in northern Finland. And, uh, you know, there's a sort of a twin city, uh, Tornio and Haparanda. And at the moment, the situation is so that you can even play golf so that you hit the ball in Finland and it will go down, hopefully, in Sweden. And um, that is something that, uh, in, in a way, tells for me that there are borders in Europe where there actually isn't any borders because the people have chosen to live together peacefully. And that is very important. I, I strongly agree what was said previously uh, uh, by uh, by Slavomir about the uh, one Europe, one system, we have to make everything to lower the barriers. Uh, uh, and that's why I, cro uh, in the first poll, I must say, I must admit that I I, uh, I answered also to the poll. And uh, we have to make everything uh, as easy as possible for people to uh, work together and live together, uh, to, wor uh, to work, to have uh, hobbies, to, to share their lives across the border, because that is how we can actually um, uh, make the best out of it. I also agree what Simona said about the people, uh, the uh, the place-based approach and people-based approach, and that is something we've been discussing a lot in this high-level group um, of the future of cohesion policy, where I am um, uh, as an individual member, um, and I must say it's really interesting uh, what the discussions we are having there. But obviously, um, uh, Andrew, you asked about uh, the Committee of the Region and uh, what uh, what we are thinking there is that uh, our common belief also, of course, in the Committee of the Regions is that we have to reinforce the fundamental aspects of uh, cohesion policy as well. At the same time, we have to find out what we have to make better. Uh, it's not the, uh, the, the right way is uh, for uh, to organize the better cohesion policy post uh, 2027 20, is not to uh, stay purely defensive, but we have to show what we can make better. And in this uh, discussion already, we uh, heard a lot of good examples by Kitty and uh, also uh, Eduardo and, and all, the, all of the previous speakers already how to mitigate the barriers and make the best out of the whole entire Europe. Obviously, here in Finland, we have um, uh, 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 problems at the moment with our um, other neighbor, as we have in all, all over Europe, uh, the our other neighbor, uh, Russia. And uh, as you all know, that uh, we've had very strong cooperation also uh, with Russia in the previous years. And um, I'm uh, and actually, I think I'm in a way kind of very sorry also about how the things have been changing uh, uh, also from this point of view. But at the same time, I think that the, the cross-border cooperation is even more important inside Europe at the moment. We have to work more together in order, in order to be stronger together and in order to get the best out of the Europe's, Europe's possibilities. And of course, obviously, as was mentioned already, the, the, the shared values and the shared uh, common understanding and the, the importance of single market, which was uh, uh, raised already in the beginning of this uh, uh, breakfast uh, debate by Slavomir, is something we all have to understand all the time and, uh, and to put enough um, um, uh, importance uh, of, of this. But um, our main political messages in this um, uh, in this issue, uh, which were already uh, pointed out in, of our opinion, which was uh, uh, 
uh, which was um, uh, adopted by anonymous vote uh, of the future of the cohesion policy by Mr. Evil Bok and Mr. Vasco Cordera, who is the president of the Committee of the Regions. The main political messages are that first, the, we definitely do need a comprehensive reform of cohesion policy in, uh, is needed uh, in order to, ad, uh, to address the situation uh, of its role and identity. And we need to find the new balance in the need of long-term investments and then the other hand um, the capacity of um, the cohesion policy funding to be agile for what, what is happening in uh, in the short term notice and secondly the very core principles uh, of the cohesion policy funding is built uh, what is built up on the shared management the multi level governance and the partnership principle should be even clearer in the future even though the the member states have a, a crucial role we definitely need more place based planning in all um, um, parts of the uh, also the border region, um, uh, cross border cooperation and the cohesion policy altogether, as was mentioned here also, because even though we have a lot of similarities, a lot of things in common there, uh, the, the richness of Europe is the, the, the large variety of cultures and uh, and um, um, ways of uh, working in the everyday life. So we definitely need uh, more place-based uh, uh, possibilities. And uh, uh, for the uh, then I, I still want to point out that uh, at the same time as we understand the good things in cohesion policy and cross-border cooperation, we have to be able to perhaps to pick up the most important things, not to say everything. We can't solve all the problems uh, with the same policies, but we have to uh, be clear to define the most important things. And we uh, cannot afford, of course, uh, having cohesion policy competing or overlapping against other European Union investments, uh, investment instruments in the future. And we have to embed the complementarities and synergies between cohesion policy and other EU instruments uh, in the next programming period. And um, to conclude, um, we must retain and build on what works well, and we must improve and what should be improved, and we must change what needs to be changed. And we have to participate, the people, especially on the borderline, to choose what is the best way to work, to come back with the golf course. Perhaps that's not working everywhere, but there are very um, uh, everyday systems that are actually helping people to live together and uh, building the better future on that area and uh, at the same time giving examples for uh, all of Europe. So perhaps this, Andrew, in, the, in, in this state. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much indeed. Um, could I just um, ask you to comment on one uh, question. It seems to me that um, part of this is, and, and your knowledge of the uh, EU budget mechanisms and the financial structures might be helpful in this, um, insofar as there is place-based policy making and there is what is essentially a territorial view about how policies should be implemented in a particular area or cross-border region, uh, and they're looking for financial support, should cohesion policy in that sense move from what Kitty was saying, moving from the sectoral to the territorial? Should, should financing be flexible enough to move out of the, the particular programmes uh, and empower the solutions that cross-border regions come up with? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, a, a tricky and a, a, an important question. From my point of view, we need simplification in all levels, because as, as we've seen uh, uh, past a few years uh, with the uh, COVID-19 and uh, and the war, uh, uh, the the situations um, overall are changing so rapidly that we can't decide everything in, in advance. And so I think the simplification is really important. And and definitely, as long as um, uh, the um, the financing uh, or the instrument keeps up uh, heading to towards the big common obstacles i think we should have more flexibility uh, definitely when it comes from uh, 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 from the um, ground so to say and uh, 
I think this is important that uh, we have a strong flexibility and possibility to combine also different instruments. I don't know if, the, if, if, if this answered to your question. Well, <laughs> in a way, uh, Kitty, you, you particularly, uh, you prompted that thought, uh, was the the move from sectoral to territorial to, to, to strengthen, as it were, and empower place-based policy making. Is the financial as well as the governance um, important? The two clearly often travel together. Uh, have you observed how that might be achieved in, fle in flexibility, both in governance and financing? Yes, I, I know that it is an important question. How can we support finance this uh, change? Um, I didn't observe well enough this question. Um, I have to point out that uh, without dedicated financing, it is uh, very hard to ensure the anything of uh, this uh, any of these interventions. Um, I think we have a few years, few months to figure it out. How can we finance uh, a such as change? Thank you very much. Uh, let me turn, if I may, and pick up questions uh, specifically from our chat. We've got some very interesting material there, <clears throat> including details of the links to the call for evidence that Simona was talking about earlier. But. Um, let me just turn firstly to the, I think it was a question from uh, Roland, if I might put it to you, Simona. He's he's saying that uh, what we need to do is not the B solutions, for example, which is a very powerful instrument, but quite often the issue is not the European legislation as such or the administration. Those, those are not necessarily the obstacles. They may well be in the national rules. So uh, can you tell us something about how to tackle those national rules and their implementation in cross-border regions as well. Well, thank you, Andrew. I, I think that B solutions also are not really aimed at EU legislation and, and, and obstacles which are coming out from the EU legislation. And that is also, also the case for um, for the possible um, legal um, instrument that or mechanism that that we would propose, because we do know that that uh, there are that there is policy and legislation how to tackle uh, the implementation of EU legislation in the member states. What we are aiming at really is is to see how to solve. Um, obstacles which are coming out very very often from nature from the discrepancies between natural uh, national legislation administrative rules uh, standards and and to to offer uh, to, to offer the citizens living in border regions the way how to address those um, on a, on, a, on a case by case basis. So it is indeed not the idea. And also this is what B solutions are doing. They are analyzing the, the situation, the problem that exists, and they are offering legal solution. But this is not really linked to, or, or it's not aimed primarily at EU legislation as such. Right. It's really the discrepancies uh, on, the, on the national or regional level. That's very helpful. I wonder, Eduardo, do you want to come in at this point, tell us something about how we can, how those uh, obstacles, the removal of those obstacles is, is perhaps being achieved in, in, perhaps we have examples that we can see that would be particularly relevant that people can look at. Well, yeah, maybe I come from a very good uh, an area, Portugal and Spain, you know, which um, is a very good example of how um, the Interact, for instance, has um, concretely contributed to transform um, an excessively close border at the beginning of the Portuguese and Spanish interests in the EU, 1986, and current times. Uh, if I ask everybody here how many, what are the, the, the leading countries in the implementing UB solutions, people would probably think, oh, it's Germany, oh, it's Holland. No, it's Portugal and Spain. And this is, this is because um, the first three interacts they uh, tackled the physical accessibility borders, which were huge. And now uh, many people don't know, but the, still the biggest uh, financed interact project um, is the Guadiana Bridge, 
that links Algarve and Andalusia. And uh, it's the iconic kind of the image of Interact because it's the most financed one. And this provided a completely uh, open the border there that was completely closed. It's still the only physical uh, accessibility connection uh, linking uh, um, um, uh, Algarve and Andalusia. And uh, all across the, the Portuguese uh, uh, and Spanish border, that was already implemented uh, around uh, seven EGTCs, which is European Groupings of Territorial Cooperation. There is many, um, I remember when I made my PhD, I, I counted it into, uh, when I finished it in 2010, there was around more than 100 cross-border entities official. Uh, before 1990, there was zero. So uh, this is examples in which this uh, Interreg has contributed uh, effectively to transform a very closed border to a very open border, which is uh, very much engaged in, in promoting cross-border corporations with many cross-border governance entities, with a lot of, uh, uh, of, of um, uh, cooperation at all levels of society, between companies, between local levels, regional levels. So there's a lot of euro regions. So, uh, yeah, this is a concrete example in which uh, uh, of the positive impacts of the Interreg in mitigating all sorts of uh, cross-border barriers from governance, from physical accessibilities, from language, as courses between young students in Spanish that learn Portuguese and uh, vice versa. There's a lot of things going on. It's a very good example of Portugal and Spain. Uh, many people probably don't know this and uh, how successful has been the implementation of Interreg between Portugal and Spain. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent, Eduardo. Thank you very much. Uh, Sari, can I turn to you? Uh, it's interesting, in the first poll, if you recall, the um, uh, digital connectivity and uh, the green transition didn't necessarily feature as main priorities. But of course, for, for many in many cross-border regions, the ability to think new thoughts that digitalization offers or to do things in a much more environmentally um, uh, uh, sustainable way through green transition can actually be a very powerful instrument for changing and removing the obstacles to cross-border cooperation. I wondered if you felt maybe the cohesion policy might in fact use those as uh, serious instruments for that purpose. Yes, Andrew, again, a uh, very, good, very good question, and I, I, I strongly agree on that. And that is what I meant when I said that uh, when we are using these different uh, uh, in instruments, we have to be make sure that the, that the big obstacles we want to achieve are, are never um, put, put aside. That, that they don't do do no harm to cohesion, do no harm to cross border cooperation, do no harm to green deal, and uh, and of, of of course the good governance is uh, something on that. And I just want to, uh, if it's okay, Andrew, uh, to agree uh, to uh, uh, go on with uh, what Eduardo said about the 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 goodness of Interreg, even though it is we have uh, several good uh, examples also in Finland and in Northern uh, Europe well, why it's working. But we definitely, uh, I think, we need also the the uh, the um, uh, special cross-border mechanism and also money for that, especially pointed on that. And uh, when we think about the digitalization and its possibilities, um, I doubt, um, you know, I think we are going to g gain more than we actually need the money in. It's going to be um, a very um, uh, positive um, uh, possibility to uh, to to share the digitalization and uh, green deal uh, obstacles also on this uh, uh, cross-border uh, cooperation. Thank you. While you have the floor, sorry, I wondered if you wanted to say anything more about uh, the people-to-people -people, uh, connections, because obviously <laughs> not just at golf clubs, uh, but uh, uh, clearly between uh, Sweden and Finland, some of those I think we've we've heard in the past. Was it the um, uh, some of your colleagues from the Gulf of Bithynia were telling us about some of the effective cooperations that were taking place. Um, it, it, have, have you found that actually the, the people to people work can overcome many of these obstacles? Definitely. It's like everywhere in the in the in, in life, you know, when you work to get work together, when you live together, you can find the way uh, to solve the barriers. And that is something when we talk about the place based uh, uh, approach, actually, it is people to people approach. And we definitely as it is in uh, in, uh, in northern Finland and also we have other uh, borders in, in, in Europe where the, the everyday life, you don't even know if you are in uh, which member state. 
uh, so you can you can actually uh, go to take your child to kindergarten uh, to another uh, country or or uh, have your hobby and of course obviously work and and do your business so it's uh, uh, I think it's the people what we need. We need more people-centric Europe altogether. That is also good for democracy, and that is also good uh, in uh, how we people believe in uh, the future of Europe. Cohesion and cooperation is in the heart of European Union, and it will be, and it has to be in the future. And it's the people who do that. Thank Andrew, you. if I if I if I may come yes. in on this because that's something oh, dear to my heart. Yes, so maybe first of all that, that there is this this people based and place based they go hand in hand because there is territory there are people who are living on this with with their ideas and with their needs so we should really look if you really work the real place based policy it cannot be done without people and and without getting down to the people and listening to them and involving them in the policy making but then there's also this strong emotional value of 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 people to people projects which which is i think quite impressive and and which gets us closer to to the people's heart and we should not really neglect this message i recall here that in in every year patty smith for a younger audience it's a it's a well pretty old but quite famous american singer and poet and she is coming to to uh, Gorizia and and giving a concert, and then she always say, you know why why I'm coming here from I think since five years or so because I feel free here. I feel here that I'm in the place where the border has been suppressed. So it is something which rings the bell not only with us Europeans but also with people from outside. And I think this this is something very powerful we should use in our campaign. Slavomir, thank you very much, and uh, we can maybe borrow another um, American. Aphorism. Tip O'Neill, you remember the American mayor who said all politics is local. Uh, so uh, actually recognizing that. I, I wonder, Simona, whether you might be able to just with with very warm thanks to all of our panelists and to those who are putting questions up on the chat. I know some of uh, our panelists might want to follow up on some of the chat remarks uh, and keep that going. There's an opportunity for that to be done uh, also through the Futurium. Uh, platform where the Border Focal Point Network is based and enables these discussions to be maintained. But Simona, just if I may lead the witness, as it were, in terms of conclusions, there is, as it were, uh, as we're, we're working through this, a very central question, which is not necessarily a dilemma, but actually may be um, a complementarity between place-based policymaking and people-to-people -people connections and the ability to demonstrate how a range of uh, programs, each of which eminently justified in their own terms for green transition, digital transition, for transport connectivity and so on, can be brought together and turned into a more effective policy for a given area and, uh, and the net result being borders have seem to disappear. But is cohesion policy right at the heart of making that happen? And uh, does this tell us something in this discussion how we can achieve that? Yeah, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, everybody, for a very interesting and and um, and constructive open open debate today on the on on the future. Um, well, I think that that um, as it was already said at the beginning, uh, and and throughout it it went as a red line throughout all the uh, all the contributions uh, of everybody. Um, we are um, at a point where we cannot really do things. Uh, as we as we used to do in the past, uh, because the, the the challenges are are imminent, they are great. People are feeling uncertain, and uh, we are living in a world which which is tremendously rapidly changing. So therefore, the European policies they have to react to that, and cohesion policy is not an exception. So um, and and it was said so many times that that uh, we need to be more place based. We need to listen to people what they really want. Uh, we need to look into the into the individual needs of the territories that we are covered covering. I think the territorial need 
was uh, approach was so many times repeated that this is not something that pol cohesion policy can ignore. So um, definitely there will be um, just to remind that that uh, there will be the cohesion, uh, the ninth cohesion report coming out in the next year, the cohesion forum, where we will uh, have another milestone to discuss all of these issues. And then then specifically on cooperation, uh, we we should have that event in 2025 where we should harvest uh, all of the results of the of the discussions and consultations. Thank you very much. Simona, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to you, uh, to Slavomir, and to all of our panellists, Sari, Kitty, Eduardo. Uh, terrific contribution. Thank you very much indeed. And also thank you to all of those on the chat. I can see there are so many issues that I, uh, I wanted to get into issues, for example, like enlargement and so on, and the relationship of uh, our border regions to our potential future cross-border cooperation. But we will get to that, I'm sure we will, and this will be an ongoing debate um, both through the chat, through the Futurium platform, uh, and in future breakfast debates. May I just remind all of our uh, participants that there is a 15th Borders breakfast debate now uh, arranged to take place on the 5th of December, and that will be to uh, discuss cross-border regions in relation to the single market. So uh, I'm much looking forward to that as well. It has been a great privilege and pleasure to have all of our panellists and all of our participants today. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, have a very good day and we look forward to seeing you all again and maintaining this very interesting discussion in the future. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you.